the Living Cities Forum, and I'd like to welcome Anupam Kundu to the forum. She is a celebrated Indian-born, Berlin-based architect, educator, and researcher. Her research-oriented practice has generated people-centric architecture based on spatial and material research for low environmental impact, while also being socially, economically beneficial. She has lived literally with her work for over 30 years, building a number of houses that she has then lived in as a working experiment in building differently. Much of that experimentation has involved a refocusing away from machine construction to what she has called handmade technologies. For Kundu, making is a way of thinking, and she's rather interested in prolonging the opportunity of thinking with hands. I'm very pleased to pass the screen metaphorically to Anapama Kundu. Well, I would like to uh, discuss today time as a resource. In architecture, we are used to talking about space, but I would like to discuss time alongside space. And when I talk about a slow architecture, I don't mean to delay things. On the contrary, I think we shouldn't be hurrying to such an extent that we don't have time to think that we, you know, it reminds me of the hare and the tortoise uh, story where um, slow and steady is sometimes faster. I would like to uh, also share with you my context. Um, I studied architecture and uh, grew up in India. And I just want to explain that many of my ideas came from having experienced this rapid urbanization as we call it today. But the thing about the Indian context is that we are about one sixth of the world's population occupying 2.4% of the world's land. So there's a big resource crunch. And you know, this is Bombay, for instance, this is how public transport uh, looks and the crowds uh, magically fit in and out of these trains. This is my experience of the city um, where I grew up and it has to a great extent shaped my thinking, not only because of Bombay being such an extreme, um, like they say, maximum city, but, the, but later I realized that this kind of urbanism is actually happening everywhere um, in the, in the uh, non-Eurocentric uh, phase of urban development that, that is happening everywhere in the world that includes social segregation that includes um, you know towers being just planted all over the place and everything else that surrounded it and emerged slowly being wiped out but not entirely wiped out there are these two worlds that seem to coexist and they are problematic because it's like two parallel cities that continue to happen they need each other and uh, there are lots of um, problems associated with a certain kind of development that comes from uh, industrialized systems in uh, from areas uh, from countries where there has been mainstream industrialization but those ideas are being planted upon the rest of the world that has not yet had uh, have see, has uh, that have not yet seen that kind of uh, mainstream industrialization so you know, I have started noticing a lot of problems in this kind of images that is uh, is going to be the springing point for everything I'm going to share with you today. So this, this is a thought that I would like to begin the talk with. There is nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. This is a quote um, from Peter Drucker that I've brought in here because this is, uh, resonates with my mood throughout my architecture studies, watching all kinds of um, architectural projects that appear to solve things, but in my mind often seem to be creating more problems than it's solved. In uh, today's day and age, I think it becomes all the more important to rethink urban materiality from scratch from first principles, because the mere repetition of uh, how things are done around us seems to be a kind of habit that we cannot um, actually sustain any longer. So I just want to 
also bring the discussion of time um, through this image where you see in Indian, in the Indian landscape, when you see architecture that, 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 that was, you know, centuries uh, ago, everywhere in the world, we've seen the, that the architecture comes out of the material from the context. And the crafting of the architecture is where uh, the advancement lies. I mean, the, whether people who claimed those materials and um, expressed them crudely or with more refinement um, explained, uh, gives us clues um, about how humans interacted with what was around them and what kind of life they wanted to have inside that kind of shelter. And, and when we look at um, something as simple as that, we realize that architectural, you know, refinement and the evolution of humans and the corresponding evolution of architecture has, has nothing to do with whether a material is vernacular or traditional or natural or man-made, it has to do actually with what is actually being made and how is the human engaging with the making of it. And obviously we are seeing a, a big exponential um, change, you know, like, uh, uh, and things, things that the old ways of doing things are being rapidly replaced. But this, this is a larger perspective I want to bring to the discussion and to just be able to step back and see whether we are still in control of what we are building while we are in a hurry. So in today's time, we can see that um, most, all, uh, most local materials all around the globe actually have been replaced by vernacular, uh, what we call the new vernacular, reinforced cement concrete frame structures and brick as infilling materials. Even, even in Australia, I was surprised to see brick being used as a veneer. And in most places, the codes don't even allow brick to carry load anymore. This is, this is just, a, the, it's become kind of an accepted fact that um, vernacular materials no longer fulfill the code. And all over the world, regardless of what material was traditionally available there, everything has been replaced by a certain kind of construction. And so although for me, architecture lies in the nothingness and the space that is built for, for the humans to inhabit, yet the, the materiality of today's architecture is problematic because like we spoke about various problems it creates, there's environmental, social, and economic problems that are manifesting through the way we build. And then what we build, builds us. So we keep um, uh, remaining in a certain loop where we perhaps have lost our control. Now, I would like to talk about uh, the future because I think that's the role of the architect to envision our next steps and to, to serve or to steer human society forward and to be able to predict the kind of spaces we need today, but also what we need tomorrow because based on what we want to become or what kind of life we want to spend. And what do we know about the future? The thing is that the, the beyond existing knowledge, there is, humans have the power of imagination and they have had the willingness to try new things. I think the future is coming towards us at such a pace and there is this exponential rate at which things are advancing that old knowledge is not going to suffice. And the old, uh, the linear way of knowing what was uh, deciding the future steps based on the past steps I think is not going to 
at all suffice. And therefore, I think we need to rely on other human qualities like the power of imagination, as well as the capacity to experiment. I think I want to um, explain that um, the future belongs to those who imagine, who experiment, and who adapt. I have uh, specifically uh, mentioned these three words because I think if we want to be, um, as humans, take charge of where we are going and based on where we are coming from, I think these are the qualities that we will need to see, especially in the architectural fraternity, because just remaining in the comfort zone is coming at a really high price and not leading to a built environment where we even feel comfortable. We are not, we, we are we feeling caged. We are feeling um, in, in a monotonous landscape with a matchbox kind of standardization where the uniqueness of individuals cannot be unleashed to serve the community. And the rest of the work I'm gonna show you is going to come from the fact that at a very early age, I, when I started my practice at the age of 23, I had decided to, to go in this direction and a lot of risks uh, taken and a lot of uh, uh, you know, optimism that drove uh, some of my decisions led to a certain kind of practice where so many years later i i can i have uh you know i've seen the that that it was really worth experimenting and i've noticed that the people who are part of such projects are also a, have been able to adapt like we've seen in covid everybody has been able to adapt and actually we must take these human capacities um, seriously and base our future landscape on, on those. So I'm going to run through a couple of points where I think if we go in this direction, we will be able to shape um, the future in a very radically different way. So um, the first point is the city as a whole. Um, to, to understand the big picture of what is going on in space and in time, to be able to zoom out and see the larger um, scope of things. And um, for example, we talk about sustainability. It's, it's not just about uh, the material of one house or uh, how a certain wall is constructed, if it's built in mud or in cement. You know, the point is, if cities are going to be sprawling, then... Uh, we are going to need uh, private cars. We are going to need a lot of infrastructure. We will not be able to retrofit certain things. So there are things you cannot do if you didn't look at the big picture and work on the big organism of, of the city construction itself. In this respect, I want to uh, share with you that uh, I have been uh, involved with uh, and have been living in uh, this experimental city that was initiated 50 years ago, um, designed by Roger Angers, Auroville. And most of the projects I'm going to show you are located there. So a new city was envisioned. It was called the city the earth needs. And it was designed um, from the point of view of being a prototype city to be able to radically rethink everything from pedestrian mobility to, um, to human-centric spaces, but high density, given the context that I explained to you about uh, being located in India and also with the population growing, um, what could be the alternative? to these towers? How do we achieve high density and keep it humane? So a whole city was dedicated to that. That's where I spent my formative years. I mean, as a, a, a with my uh, new architecture practice. And that's where a lot of, um, um, you know, the, the, the whole context in which uh, my projects um, were developed 
had that kind of idealism and there was already this thinking about uh, not repeating everything that has gone wrong in the other cities. And so that gave me a head start. Uh, you know, this is the plan that was produced by Roger Angers in 1968, where uh, instead of tower, there were these horizontal structures where the roof was part of the pedestrian space and everything was compact, uh, like Venice, uh, all these streets, there, were, there are no roads, as you can see here, everything um, was people-centric. A barren land was uh, completely, you know, where nothing would grow, where the topsoil had gone off to the, you know, been drained into the sea after every monsoon, has been converted by the people into this kind of landscape today. And this is one of my projects in the foreground, but I just want to give you an idea of the context in which it is located, where uh, cities do not necessarily have to mean uh, the way we have handled uh, high-speed city construction, where you first build all the infrastructure, and, uh, take down all the trees, and then build all the housing. In this case, the land, a brown field was forested and you know the city is sprouting slowly through an equal amount of top down and bottoms up approaches and uh, yes it's 50 years is a long time but look at the landscape that was generated and cities do not mean depletion it could mean the creation of abundance the second um, area i'm these are i've listed uh, 10 areas where things could change if if we were to and uh, to uh, recognize our own time the time of our own lives as a resource and we if we could put uh, unleash that and let that flow and reorganize the way we do things then we could have certain areas of change and i've listed those so uh, i'm talking about laboratory instead of having utopia or raising our having having ideals that we are never planning to arrive at um, and on the other hand continuing the banal way of doing things we need to look at the small steps that take place in a laboratory and i think architecture the nature of architecture is to, to, to uh, work in a laboratory condition where each project is actually making a small advancement and uh, furthering the way we do things so that each time we did a thing, we are better equipped to take another small risk the next time rather than just saying in today's uh, climate, you know, that everything has to be, um, you know, dictated by larger trends and large supply chains and uh, standardization, over standardization. So um, in, in this respect, uh, I have continued after Roger Angers passing away, I'm still working on some of these larger housing structures where we are, um, you know, developing integrated systems for energy, water, waste, urban farming, etc. cetera. Here um, you see, um, when I was teaching at the University of Stuttgart, uh, my students are working on one of these elements to rethink housing as co-housing, as uh, through small uh, clusters of community living. We are discussing with Jan Gale here, who had come to review uh, the work and considering what would happen if those streets would run on various levels and how could we create new models of vertical uh, development. So um, this is, I think, the biggest challenge for everywhere uh, in the world because the tower typology uh, liberates land, but it alienates people inside their own boxes in that they inhabit and all the public services are only on the ground floor so uh, each further floor they are away from social life so this is being questioned here on the other hand um, on the talking about laboratory there has been a lot of material research that i have also um, undertaken 
I'm just going to run you through some of them. This is a round wood house that I first built for myself um, immediately when I left Bombay and moved to Auroville. And the, the, the idea was to, first of all, it's a very affordable way of building and living, but the round wood, instead of a timber profile, it can be a much younger tree and it has a much uh, higher cross-sectional strength uh, whereas a, a piece of timber would have to have grown much more uh, to be able to cut the same cross section out in a square. But uh, this kind of uh, construction is, is con completely natural. It's all tied with rope. Nothing is, uh, there's no cement in it. And um, it was also a kind of uh, experiment about you no know, questioning how permanent should houses actually be. So this is how I actually began you know, coming from Bombay as a city girl, but it was also a, a, a laboratory for me in, in how to live in a different way and how adaptable are we really? Um, and if, if through simple living, if I would be able to liberate my own personal time to, be, to, to, to find time to think and contemplate and not just uh, have to do something, being a wage slave, you know, somewhere and not uh, knowing how to, um, you know, to, to, to actually put my own thoughts into action. I, I think this was one of the first big decisions I took to risk, uh, to, to make my life simple, to be able to afford to pay that kind of life and to have time on my hands to think before I act. So through this kind of lifestyle and building with very little uh, on one hand to other projects that were much more radically experimental, like uh, baking mud, situ, mud houses in situ and converting them to brick. Um, this is a project called Voluntariat that I have, uh, uh, you know, um, it was also the topic of my PhD to be able to build mud houses with mud mortar and then use it as a kiln, stuff it with other bricks. Because, you know, what happens is when we uh, fire bricks in a kiln, about 40% of the heat that is generated, it's a lot of heat it just gets spent on the kiln walls again and again. And so we are trying to tap that heat and to fire a mud house and convert it into brick. It cooks for about three days and fire is the cement. So you don't need any cement. All uh, the, the, the domes and vaults make, um, make the architecture entirely possible out of mud, but it delivers the strength of brick and it's waterproof. So these are kind of radical experimentations, uh, even though that the photographs look vernacular looking, but the point is, I think we need to radically experiment because we need to think about materiality in a radically new way um, so that we are not such a burden uh, on ourselves even, not only on the planet. So here you see, um, you know, after such a house is fired and stabilized, it, the, the product bricks can be sold and the house becomes a producer of building materials rather than uh, a consumer. So this is a very different way of thinking. Um, this is, it was pioneered by Ray Meeker, Californian ceramist, um, who actually fired along with bricks, all kinds of other ceramic products like um, toilet, pans, wash basins, tiles, all kinds of things. There's a lot of ceramics in architecture and it could be produced along with the house. This is how the project turned out. Uh, these are homes for homeless children. So that was about laboratory and experimentation. Then is the, the other aspect of nurturing. I'm talking about human capacities and how if we use our time and our human capacities, what kind of outcome we could have, we could, what kind of abundance we could uh, generate instead of shortage. I have practiced in areas with extreme shortage of resources and only through our own time uh, that we devoted to projects, we were able to create 
that kind of abundance. So there was nothing and then there's something. And actually, if you look at the old images I showed you of, of the stone architecture, you notice that every generation humans have spent their lives and gone, they have left their work behind. And all of those spaces are, uh, are spaces that we can continue to use. So actually we would be needing less to, to build less and not that much more. So when if we were to use our nurturing capacities, um, we would go beyond ownership through human care and generosity, we would be able to create that kind of abundance. I mean, in Auroville, one of the things that attracted me was the fact that land belongs to the commons. It doesn't belong to anyone. But like many ancient tribes, maybe the ownership itself uh, of land was the first problem. And, and there are all of this needs to be questioned. So, you know, Auroville, was initiated with all these 123 countries who came down with some soil from their nations and put it together in an urn. Uh, so, you know, I think there is some, some aspect of humans wanting to produce things that is related to their territory, including the production of building materials and ownership of land and ownership of everything that we do and produce is, is a very problematic construct. So these are brick making kilns. I have uh, observed how old, old communities um, that continue to produce building materials in local areas uh, in, in India, you see that the brick makers are not just brick makers, they're also farmers. They're also uh, growing this kind of wood. They've cut the thinnings the wood that was used in my house, casuarina, is used for scaffolding, actually. But they are, they are planted by the same people when a season uh, is not appropriate for rice farming. So there's a whole cycle of things, how humans engage with the territory. And the result is this kind of building material. And, but it's not the only thing the people do. So the bricks will be priced differently as opposed to an industrial brick. So this whole territorial engagement and how humans uh, began to produce architecture from what is available in the territory also needs to be looked at and not necessarily through the ownership lens. So this is, you know, communities who uh, source lime and that's what they do. But, you know, the question is the, the, when, when humans engage with material sourcing themselves, there is an automatic balance in, of, of the scale at which it, it remains unproblematic. Like this is a stone quarry that is very different from a machine quarry where you see, see humans are still extracting stone by hand. This is for a project. We were cutting out slabs straight from the mountain. Um, I have tried to use those kind of discoveries um, that I made in my landscape these are all in a very small area around Auroville where I just managed to travel around and uh, take my time and notice more and divert all of that into the architecture that I produced. So just from a very small area, the wide palette of materials and building technologies developed. And also in, I have at the same time been able to negotiate to what extent an industrially made terracotta can you know, screen like you see here can co coexist with, let's say, a handmade one, or or in which situation, and to what degree is the man, the 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 hand, and the machine um, collaborating with each other? And I think these are all decisions for our time. But again, this is a this is a project that we manage with very little resources to produce a daycare for children from very uh, underprivileged backgrounds to have a very stable place to grow up and, uh, and, and uh, you know, develop uh, and have a safe haven. And other projects that I have produced like youth hostels, libraries, with very, very minimal resources, but through a kind of collective, um, you know, effort. 
then uh, the other thing is to allow for human intelligence if we could rely on human ingenuity and engineering we could probably you know save a lot of resources too i mean we could save a lot of materials so some of my early research involved building terracotta um, roofs that were self supporting by being built on catenary um, shaped uh, you know forms um, developed through this kind of guide and um many of you probably know this house wall house my own house actually it was produced because i had discovered that there were a lot of skills and there was a pottery there were pottery uh, pottery was widespread as a, a capacity there were communities who were not able to survive because they were not able to any more sell those kind of pots and i felt we could divert this capacity to make products to make uh, architecture with a high quality and so you know this is a way of extending their livelihood but on the other hand producing architectural elements that give us much better conditions um, you know use less uh, steel use less um, you know you know you, you know not need insulation and use less material but also these are produced with coconut shells very locally alongside the rice uh, fields as you can see so my early practice began with this kind of you know um, trying to see how you could do things intelligently and not only through our own architectural office investigating that but through through the involvement of masons and others the potters and how could we all be intelligent and produce you know even these bricks these are very very low quality let's say low quality compared to to the industrial bricks but these are made with the leftover clay that after monsoon gets deposited in in the you know lakes and low lying areas it's a way of spending and building with whatever you have around you and if the uh, resulting brick is weaker you can have slightly thicker walls but the whole thing has a uh, results in an architecture that is contemporary but rooted in the place through the work of the people and through engaging the people in making them so these are the traditional cooking pots that i used uh, to produce lost form work to be able to cast um coffered um waffle slabs that uh, save um two steel bars out of three compared to conventional reinforced cement um slabs you know so i i basically been experimenting and i think there is a great potential for saving huge amounts of natural materials natural resources if we were to freely and generously spend some of our human resources of intelligence of brain of time of our muscle and so on so this is the the house that resulted with that kind of thinking so talking about this um i think we the future could be much more light we could achieve many more square meters with much less resources if we were to really focus on the engineering aspect one area i've been working on is to um, reduce big steel bars and thick reinforced cement concrete sections to build with ferro cement which is a lighter version of it with only chicken mesh but also looking into other textiles and natural fibers that could in the future replace steel so ferro cement has a huge potential because it's a very very light and thin easy to make and easy to carry so i've been producing some kind of modular home systems it's called fulfill home where colored pigments oxides are also embedded in those pieces uh, so that you don't even need a final finishing to those elements and in in about a week you can assemble a house or an office with these elements and it's very very cheap we have exhibited this in one of the biennales in full scale but uh, next to it is a toilet unit which can be assembled in a day 
But uh, when you load test these, you'll see that there is ferro cement has a much more ductile uh, property than uh, compared to uh, reinforced concrete and therefore it has also seismic properties. I think it could be very, very relevant to disaster relief and to a rapid urbanizing world where we use many, uh, much less resources. So this is the toilet unit I spoke about. So <clears throat> the other point I want to make is that in the future, there will be much more value through design because uh, rather than merely manufactured, uh, you know, mass produced, mass manufactured pro products in that landscape, I think we are going to start valuing design. And I think therefore we really um, don't have to become impotent or passive as architects and designers feeling overwhelmed in a, uh, in a, in a, in the mass production world. I think design will emerge as an area of, of, uh, um, um, not only will it be a tool to produce a different kind of landscape that is more conscious, but I think we are going to value the, the human mind, maybe not the human hand, but at least the human mind in, the, in what we manufacture. So, um, for instance, um, with taking the ferrocement discussion further, um, this one is a, a real uh, trying to look at uh, folding uh, crease patterns through origami and other um, traditions of the past to be able to make ferro cement more rigid. So we have been uh, experimenting. Um, here is a, another idea for a shelter. In fact, I did this when I was in Brisbane in the, at the UQ. Uh, we tried to have uh, use carton as lightweight form work recycled carton to be able to fold these structures and to be able to take it to disaster relief sites and to, to be able to cast ferro cement either on paper because it's so light or on uh, or even without form work as you see in this image. And this is a test structure that you can put up also in three or four days. And th these are just experiments, but I think there is such a potential for design to enter as a, a, a real serious discipline um, and to be able to radically reshape the landscape, the future landscape. So here are some of my uh, research, further research with ferro cement, pigments, etc., exhibited in Louisiana Museum of Modern Art recently. And in this respect, I'm also working a lot with, you know, the urban waste. These are uh, furniture made out of books. There's this everywhere, there's things, if, if designers involve themselves, uh, there's so much to be done. There's potential in everything that we have around us to transform our problems into solutions rather than the other way around. There is a, a, a project I also did while I was at UQ. Um, we did a pavilion in Barcelona called Library of Lost Books where we recycled books um, into canopies uh, because books in Australia, I found they get pulped um, in Spain, they get burnt. It's a big source of urban waste, actually. There's over-publication happening. And we produced, uh, since it was a temporary pavilion for just four months, we made everything. We just took uh, all the canopy from the garbage, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we took obsolete things and we extended their life. Uh, it was a symbolic um, message. We, that we wanted to also make. And the, the steel structure that holds it, it's like, you know, re, uh, building trees, bring, you know, creating shade, a uh, shade of books representing knowledge and producing this kind of a summer pavilion, very simple with very little means. The furniture is made out of magazines, which you see below. And otherwise uh, you see, all the knowledge, you know, the, you, you know, you, every, people are actually library of lost books, it was called, but they, the reading goes on. The object of the book is uh, transcended. <clears throat> so um, the, the steel structure was made very solid because it was, uh, these were three separate elements and it now has been put, put up and given a second life in a, in a school courtyard. So 
there are other things we did with students of the UQ when we went to David Chipperfield's Biennale in 2012, where we actually uh, translated some of those ideas with glass bottles, or I've done masonry with other glass or cracked glass for uh, you know finishing the domes in the voluntariat project or uh, using uh, discarded bicycle wheels as form work. So, you know, you, in absorbing urban waste is part of that quest to reduce material consumption. This is in Mexico. We've filled um, Tetra Pak, which nobody knows how to dispose. It's very complex with its four materials, but very, very durable and waterproof. They got filled with sand and water and used as, as bricks. And that now we are also looking at the denim problem, the rests of genes manufacture, India and China supply the genes to the rest of the world and all the rests are left behind. So we are trying to produce fabric structures out of those rests so that they don't just lie in heaps in factories to be, I mean, in, in as landfill. So, I mean, there's a huge potential through design and already in academia where we could really come in and help uh, to create a much better landscape. Then um, co-creation. I think if we help individuals to be aligned with the collective rather than working of the collective and the individual working against each other or against the environment, if there is this alignment with the environment and um, individual and collective, you can produce certain kinds of landscape which are which are hopefully going to be the landscape of the future. So even in simple residences that are in very tight plots in India, we've we've tried to create these kind of you know um, tra gentle transitions between the indoor and outdoor because being aware and not being fully cut off from the environment in controlled climate uh, helps us to remain humane and to act like that uh, in everything we do. And at the same time have, uh, have a high quality of life. Uh, there are other projects we achieved, co-housing projects where we could enable the liberate the time of people to be um, to produce or contribute to the making of their own housing, to the making of their own housing. This is, in this case, rammed earth uh, being used from the wastewater treatment plant um, and spending the, the soil excavated there to produce walls. And at the same time, with, uh, with the different people and skills, creating communities so that you can build affordably by sharing certain square meters, sharing some guest rooms, sharing kitchens, et cetera, increasing the sharing component and relying on each other, allowing human time to be uh, at, uh, in, in, included in, in the way that the technologies don't alienate people. And then as a result, reduce significantly the bank loans that you would need to take. So. These are streets on upper levels. This is this co-housing project. And that brings me also to collaboration as an idea. I think the future landscape for architects should move away from competition to collaboration. Of course, competition can continue and will continue. The thing is, competition's purpose was to bring excellence in terms of projects. But often that's not the case because uh, people who have not entered the scene are finding it increasingly difficult to enter. And there's so many projects and so much architectural work being produced and small studios getting shut down that I think, in fact, perhaps the time has come to look for excellence through collaboration and not have so many paper projects uh, filling up, uh, you know, the shelves, but let people contribute to the making of um, you know, uh, to be more ef efficient, to, to work with others, not only uh, collaborate among architects to um, supplement the skills and knowledge 
And through that's another way excellence can be created. This can also happen interdisciplinary. We have been uh, taking the, we've taken the line of goodwill as it was called this first urban housing project in Oroville that is of that urban scale. And we have tried to produce this including students, including other architects, whoever has a vision to be able to plug into the urban design, uh, working with um, from the very early stage with um, climate engineers like Transolar or, or uh, structural engineers, people who will consider, you know, with, with the latest generation of power um, generating paints that can be embedded in concrete or behind, you know, this is, this is in the Louisiana exhibition where we had a 18 meter long model in one to 50 scale uh, where, and, and behind we had uh, the facade of the future built in one to one scale with waste denim. Uh, this is a scaffolding of ideas, you know, and, and, and the latest generation of solar photovoltaics that you can um, um, integrate into the material itself and um, urban farming and all these ideas, bringing them all uh, through collaboration right from the conceptual stage and producing a kind of landscape that is very, very different in the future, hopefully, and yet keeping the density. Uh, so um, this these projects uh, were generated by mostly my students from Yale University, uh, KADK in Copenhagen and uh, Potsdam, where I'm a professor right now in the, from the Fachhochschule. And yet, uh, you know, so this is an urban project, which is very 18 story high, but there are uh, the, when you walk through those terraces, you see that there is a very humane scale, the human scale, the social spaces, the intimacy that we always had in villages and in the old towns. Uh, it's something that because our biology has not changed as much as our um, uh, other uh, you know, habits. So we still have the same needs. Uh, from architecture to, in those areas and 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 that is possible to explore in high rise so so this is another glimpse of that project that was also the, this whole room was called co-creation and all the collaborative works that i've done were exhibited in this large room and here you see the ideas of urban farming water management etc as integrally uh, embedded into the the architecture of the housing so those find a very organized space. Uh, these are actually um, going to perhaps be the materials of the future. So I'm just coming down to the last two points. One of, the, one of them is that, uh, you know, the future uh, ought to, I think it ought to be much more youth led rather than, you know, uh, the past, uh, past heavy, where we are, we are not letting young people uh, who, you know, to, you know, enter the scene easily. Uh, I think if we would allow and collaborate with them from a very early age, they will right through from school already feel be empowered to uh, and not tempted to keep on studying forever, but to just immediately contribute. These are some of my workshops. This is a workshop that I did uh, when I took the students of the AA to India to explore roundwood construction. But I think if we uh, through teaching, what I try to do is um, give students inside the architecture studio a real experience in full scale, uh, real materials, real scale, real deal with real people and real places. And these four encounters are very important for students to feel empowered to actually take charge and do things, have the confidence to navigate whatever problems they will face. I would like to conclude with the 10th point that um, you know work will in the future hopefully be seen as an area of self-development instead of just being a means to earn one's living. Because through this, there'll be true fulfillment and each human intelligence and, and advancement, the personal advancement that each person makes would not only lead to their personal fulfillment, but it will allow us to work 
in in a, in a richer uh, in richer teams so that you know that we have these large architecture offices where a lot of people are not allowed to apply their mind because some one senior has to apply the mind and the others below them have to often just follow um because they have to that's their livelihood and i think if we i think i think this is also an area that can change uh and uh, you know if if work is not something that it's a burden and one has to do it and not like one's job etc but if we really look at it for what it is it's an area to develop ourselves and to advance um we should rely on uh, on this kind of changes i think in the future or help steer it and to recognize therefore that time is a resource but our own for our own life the way we spend our personal time is probably got the biggest clues um to allow uh, uh, br- bring us to fulfillment and i would like to end with this um thought that finally as humans what we have and what will serve us is our optimism however bad the problems look and however overwhelming they may look what humans can achieve through good will and collective imagination of course with the backdrop of optimism is i think phenomenal and i think uh, i think also when i look at my own life and with uh, three decades having uh, in the in the midst of a very um, a different kind of practice that i persisted uh, i think a lot of things can be achieved even in one life and it looks very slow when we are paving the way for something but you look back and you see uh, that you've done a lot of things you've explored a lot of things and if you failed you at least still know what you don't know and i think it's very important to remain alive and to try and uh, and that's why uh, it it begins with the idea of time and how we use every moment of our time thank you this is the living cities forum and i'd like to welcome martin galen to the forum galen is an award winning brussels based designer and researcher and a leading practitioner in changing the ways materials are used in architecture and construction engineering he is co-founder of the collective rotor a co- collaborative cooperative design practice that investigates the organization of the material environment with the aim of helping designers and architects to salvage building produce to reduce waste it sounds simple right it's like how we recycle our bags or our newspapers but it's really not that simple having followed rotor's work and watched some of their lectures It has been come clear, come clear to me that this rather simple ambition is nothing short of a herculean task. Well into its second decade, Rotor now employs dozens of staff and is working on expanding the vertical integration of its processes. It has been noted elsewhere, rather charmingly, that Martin started his career at the age of 15, selling decorative items and objects found in scrap merchants and flea markets to fashion stores and florists. at a time when we all might be wondering how can i do my bit there is perhaps something to say about a young man starting with a small idea and discovering a few years later that it was a rather good one i'm very pleased to welcome martin galen to living cities forum martin the screen is yours okay um in the preparation of this uh, of 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 this presentation um what well, to be honest I, i guess we all have these presentations that we've been given for Uh, a few years in which we changed just a few slides but i soon realized that for uh, for this occasion I, i i needed to come up with something else so i'm trying out um, a new format uh, which follows um a, a timeline um so i will roughly start somewhere in the 50s and uh, end up in uh, uh, the year 21 um and one of the question was of course where to begin uh, it would have been quite logical uh, given the, the 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 nature of my story to start with the 1958 world exhibition in in brussels but it 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 seemed appropriate to me to um to go just a few years before that and 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 make a quick mention of the the catastrophe in the so called bois de casier uh, mine in marcinel um so um roughly 10 years after the uh, end of the second world war a huge uh, fire broke out underground in this uh, in this coal mine and 
Um, later investigations showed that it was basically a, a very dangerous elevator uh, that made a hydraulic uh, cable uh, um, blow and, uh, and, and, and this literally set the, the, the mine on fire. Um, what is quite interesting also to see is that in, 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 this was totally unanticipated. Um, uh, the reaction of, of politicians and firemen was to ask people to come and give them uh, their fire extinguishers if they had any, any at home. So um, a later investigation also showed that uh, what was actually to blame was a sort of a, um, a zealous effort uh, of the, 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 the national states to re, um, uh, well, re reach the production levels uh, in, in terms of steel, coal, and so on, um, that had, they, had been accomplished before the, 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 the Second World War, sort of a kickstart of the economy, but with decades old uh, in infrastructure. So a catastrophe was bound to happen. But um, the general atmosphere of the 50s uh, was one of optimism in, in, in Belgium. The World Exhibition in, uh, um, in, taking place in, in, in Brussels celebrated sort of a, a very futuristic, uh, optimistic, uh, concrete glass, steel, aluminium uh, based um, uh, uh, way of construction. Uh, in the background, you see the Atomium, uh, a, a marvelous uh, a building. It's, um, uh, the enlargement of a, uh, a steel uh, atom. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a moment where a lot of things are going on in, in, in Belgium and there is a sort of a, a total um, re, um, redevelopment of the infrastructure uh, of the country in terms of roads, industry, uh, self-image and so on. So at the same time, uh, with the World Exhibition, a number of huge uh, construction projects uh, are undertaken. Um, and uh, one that I would like to point out is the so-called uh, State Administrative Center. Uh, in 1958, it is this barren land uh, on which um, um, previously stood uh, almost an entire neighborhood that has been uh, demolished to make place for uh, almost, well, a bit more than uh, 300,000 square meters of office space. It is a combination of a horizontal slab and a vertical uh, uh, slab. So by 1965, a first part of this, um, of this building has been, uh, has been completed. What you see here is a view of the, of the, uh, the cafeteria. Uh, the cafeteria, which is sized at half of the capacity of the building, so it can host 7,000 uh, uh, workers uh, simultaneously. And um, the, the, the building is, 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 is quite magnificent, for instance. Um, let me point out these aluminium, um, so-called alucromatic wall panels that uh, were produced by uh, Ralph Kermans on a special commission by the, by the, by, by the ministry. It's um, a quite a remarkable process. So they are, um, this is a group of, of painters um, who are using the same pigments um, that um, are um, uh, uh, typically used to, to print logos on chocolate packaging. This is Belgium, of course. Um, but they apply these pigments um, uh, in, uh, in, in, on a larger scale and they're able to uh, make these decorative uh, panels uh, on which the, the, the pigments um, are, are actually part well, they're encrusted in the uh, the oxidation layer of the of the aluminium. It's a it's a technique that uh, I've only seen in uh, in this specific period in in in, uh, in, in our small country. Um, the the technique well uh, needs to happen quite 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 fast. So you have uh, a sort of a very spontaneous. Um, uh, a very quick way of, of, of drawing and uh, Ralph Clermans, uh, he combined a sort of a figurative uh, language with, with, a, with a more abstract one. So we, we see uh, after this period of 1958, we see a, the, the, a number of, of quite important projects for Brussels at a very, very fast pace being completed. For instance, the headquarters of 
um, the um, uh, socialist uh, uh, health insurance organization um, with an open floor plan uh, and centralized meeting rooms uh, with round tables so that uh, meetings could place in a non-hierarchical way quite a, a, an advanced sort of open plan uh, um, uh, office space for for that time 1967 uh, totally different uh, project um, uh, the idea of, re, uh, of, of, of demolishing uh, almost 54 uh, hectares of uh, land in um, on, on the border of three municipalities that are part of the, of the of the Brussels region. The idea was to build their eight World Trade Centers and to start uh, a sort of a Belgian um, Manhattan. The idea being that all these towers would be connected uh, with a sort of a, a plinth um uh, that would run throughout the, the city so the car level would be below the walking level um and you see here that a, a number of other buildings in the in the city uh, have actually been built in anticipation of this uh, universal plinth um that would connect all of the all, all of this modernistic uh, structure at the later time and you can see on the left side of this image, the sort of the scale of the, the bourgeois 19th century housing as compared to uh, the new modernistic projects, uh, they, they are, they almost fit in the, in the, in the underlying plinth and, and ventilation uh, shaft. 1971, the Delinea building, um, 1972, um, again on a, on, a, on a quite similar plinth for similar reasons, the so-called General de Banque, which is a, a magnificent building, quite a marvel of construction because the subway is running through the building uh, at an underground level. It is finished with some of the most expensive and uh, fashionable materials at that time. I think if today um, you would make an attempt of um, exporting that much uh, Wenge wood uh, from Congo, it would probably be seen as a, as a war crime. Um, the, the granite floor is, is, is exquisite uh, Italian craftsmanship and so on and so on. In 1984, uh, so more than 25 years after the start of the um, construction uh, process on the uh, state administrative center, uh, it, is finally, uh, it, it is finally finished. And so uh, in 1984, is also the year in which I, I, I was born. Um, and uh, it is also the year in which the uh, Brundtland uh, Commission is, uh, is being gathered. And I think um, I, I, I like this, um, this moment quite, quite a lot because uh, there is something so, so incredibly um, science fictional uh, about it. So, uh, the, the United Nations Council uh, gives the mandate uh, to Gro Harlem Brundtland and, and, uh, and a bunch of other people to formulate an aspirational goal for the world community. And I, I think it's, it's quite an amazing design brief. Like it's, it's, it's maybe the ultimate uh, de design brief. And um, as a, as a, in a reaction to that, uh, a book is being uh, or a report is being published uh, called Our Common Future uh, that uh, for the first time um, attempts to give a definition of uh, what is sustainable uh, de development. And uh, so that I, I guess the, the, the definition of sustainable development, uh, we've, we've all heard it uh, hundreds of times, uh, meeting the needs of the present, without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. But um, I, I find it a, a, a remarkable little bit of, of text um, for, for two reasons. Well, there's two things that I um, kind of find interesting in, 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 in this. Well, the first, the first thing is the, this, this notion of needs, um, which uh, actually postpones the political discussion about what sustainability is to uh, very specific, very um, 
contextual uh, uh, other places. Because if you think that uh, individual mobility is um, is is, is uh, absolutely necessary, is absolutely a, a need, then there can be such a thing as a sustainable airport. Uh, if you think that chocolate is a human need, then there can be such a thing as sustainable chocolate. If you disagree with uh, these things being needs then uh, actually the, the the conversation uh, switches and a, a second point that i wanted to underline is this this idea of future generations because uh, for me um, um what, what this changes it means that even if we would get all the humans that live on this planet in a sort of a democratic vote about uh, this or that uh, possibility, and everybody would vote uh, for A instead of B, we still do not have the legitimacy to take that choice uh, because we need to um, take into account the opinion of people that haven't been born yet. And, and I, I find this a, a marvelous uh, idea because it allows you to, 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 to extend this, this, this courtesy also perhaps to non-humans or to humans that are very human but uh, do not have a seat at the table or, 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 or having a hard time being uh, heard. And so uh, for me this, this opens up the, the political question um, uh, about what is decent, what is a decent thing to do, um, and, and, and it makes us all responsible uh, uh, in, in, in trying to formulate answers uh, to, this, uh, to this assignment. And so what we see uh, is, is that, that this remains an, an open and unresolved uh, uh, question for, for decades after the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the publication of the, of the report. If you want to design a facade, what, is this, what is, does a facade look like that does not compromise the ability of future generations? Probably this will be different in Paris than in, uh, than, than in Mumbai um, and, and so on. Uh, in the in the first few decades after the the, the publication of the uh, of, of our common future, uh, the, the the immediate architectural influence of this of 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 these ideas is is almost absolutely zero. Um, in in the 70s, uh, in, in in Brussels, there, there was uh, some form of eco architecture, but uh, by the, the time we're in the 80s and the 90s, this uh, this 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 quite immediately disappears. Um, we see the establishment of um, the environmental office in, uh, in in Brussels. 92 was sort of a, a very necessary reminder and and and. Um, uh, a clarification of some of the wording uh, uh, of, of our common future in the Convention of, of Rio, but um, in by, by the mid 90s, um, we are still building quite exactly the master plan of, of the the the, uh, um, the 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 Manhattan neighborhood. Like in 1996, we complete two of the eight envisioned towers. There were already four built, so. Um, six have been built in 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 in, in total. Um, it's quite amazing to see that these ideas were already circulating for such a long time, and that uh, architecture absolutely did not uh, pick them up. Two thousand and one, the Belgian state uh, has financial uh, problems, sells the uh, state administrative uh, center to a conglomerate of private investors only to rent it back uh, it immediately. So there is a transfer of um, state property to, to, to private uh, owners. And uh, of course, uh, a decade later, we will see that uh, uh, there is at least uh, some, some mist about uh, how these decisions uh, were taken. 2006, oh, I forgot to, to, to mention uh, this, no, sorry, 2001. Um, I, I did mention that Ralph Clermans, when he got uh, the, um, the, the, the commission for, for doing these uh, aluminum paintings for, the, 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 for covering the, 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 the cores of the concrete cores of this, uh, of this magnificent building, that it was a special commission by the, the, the ministry um, and um, it turns out that this special order ha had not been processed in the appropriate ways that the minister actually had no mandate uh, for giving direct commissions uh, to, this, to this artist. And so his invoice 
uh, has been disputed from the 60s uh, onwards. So Ralph Clermont was in a, in a process with the state uh, for, uh, for uh, well, a legal battle with the state for receiving payment for his, his work. And the new owner of the, the building uh, sort of inherits this, uh, this, this, this legal uh, question and invites the artist just to remove the panels. And so here you see uh, Ralph's uh, grandchildren uh, visiting the building uh, just before the panels are uh, prepared to be taken out uh, of it. 2004, so I, I, I was just graduated uh, one year from, uh, from high school and I, I started working as a, as, as a technician. Um, one of the events that I, um, that I, that I worked on as a, as a roadie was, was an open air cinema with a lot of uh, program uh, around it that was taking place in the uh, state administrative uh, center. And so it, it is there that I discovered this, this building. And it was also at, the, at, at this age of, of 19 that I uh, realized that uh, beyond sort of the, the absurdity of, of, of it, um, that it was a very strong image, that there was something particular about, about this building. I remember vividly uh, the, the pictures taken uh, by uh, Vincent Beckman uh, in the in the last days before the the emptying out of that uh, of, of that building sort of documenting uh, the life of these uh, 10 14000 uh, uh, government workers being trained in uh, on a daily on, on on a daily basis and the sort of the situations um, that uh, that that occurred behind this uh, modernistic uh, architecture and so soon after this um, this 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 festival uh, the whole place was sort of shut down boarded up and the demolition uh, of uh, everything but the structure would start and so with uh, with Tristan uh, with whom I, I will later have uh, co-founded Rotor um, we we were very curious to what was going on in inside of this building during the um, the, the demolition phase so of course it's one of the highest towers in uh, in, in, in Brussels, and so we, we would sneak up into the, the, the demolition site, going through the basement, finding our, our, our way uh, in, into the building, uh, avoiding the night guards, and, uh, and have sort of little picnics on the, on, on the roof with one of the best views, uh, probably one of the most dangerous, but also one of the best views of, uh, of, of Brussels. And, and on our way down, we would stop in the big uh, halls that used to uh, host the, 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 these thousands of, of government workers and, and marvel at, at some of the very weird design options. Well, the, the options of design that, become, that, that became self-evident now that the building was being uh, dismantled. And uh, above all, what we felt was a, a, a feeling, or maybe I should talk about it, it Personally, at this at this point, I I felt a lot of regret that this was the the, the way that this building was being uh, that was being treated. That this was the only option to sort of just trash everything and 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 start and start over. It seemed like a huge uh, missed opportunity, a huge waste of of resources, of of time, of talent. And uh, at that moment, we we we, we sort of. Uh, scavenged uh, a few light switches and 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 some uh, an ibm clock or, or or some small stuff but we were really not in a position to to do anything uh, about this about a year later tristan uh Lionel de Vlier and i co-founded uh rotor and uh, we were working under the label of being a group of people with a shared interest in uh, material flows how do materials transit in society? That was more or less uh, what we were interested in. And so we started visiting uh, companies. What you see here is a leather producer. This was a tarpaulin producer. And we, we, we started making a sort of a catalog of the materials that uh, did not fit in the, in, in the system. Uh, waste products that were created with the same sort of scale or the same rhythm as uh, the, 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 the products um, 
like for every square meter of, uh, of tarpaulin, there would be a little offcut. Uh, and, and so uh, in an industrial contract, the, this, this quickly amounts to, to, to huge um, uh, quantities. At that point, this, this was the only thing that we were doing as a, as a design office. We were visiting companies and taking pictures of the, of the trash bin. We were very well received. We had absolutely no proposal. Uh, we had the intuition that there was something to do about, this, uh, the, about these materials. But we were quickly a bit stuck in, in, in what was actually our, our proposal. And so in 2006, um, we, we decided to uh, take a, a different method of, uh, of, of research. We, we decided to try and do construction, uh, making, doing as a, as a way of, of thinking. So previously, we would just visit companies and then um, sort of go through the images, have discussions, and, 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 and uh, it was a very cere cere cerebral thing. And in 2006, because um, one of us had passed uh, uh, in front of this, this, this concrete structure, so uh, what you see here is actually a plot of land that had been cleared in the, in the 70s during the, the boom, the construction boom in, in, in Brussels, but the new building had never, uh, had, never been in the, had never been built. And so there was this buttress concrete structure there on which we envisioned uh, building a sort of a, a shed uh, that uh, we would use as an office, as a research uh, center, as a, as a way of, uh, um, as, as a space for our, for our practice. Mm. Um, yeah, coincidentally, this, this established us as a, um, as a, as, a, as, a, as a design practice, uh, this project was published numerous times um, and, and, and won even some, some architecture prizes to our, our sort of, uh, um, let's say, uh, surprise. Um, in the end, as an office, it, it was not really uh, very um, uh, efficient. The, 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 the windows were made of, of plastic tape. Uh, adhesive tape, so so you can imagine how difficult it was to to heat this space, but as a sort of an event space uh, where we could host uh, talks and little parties and barbecues and so on, it, it was quite uh, it was quite perfect. So in two thousand and six, uh, for me this and 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 maybe this is a very partial, very uh, personal view, but but for me two thousand and six is more or less the moment in which the ideas of sustainability start reaching uh, architecture again. As I said, there are exceptions. Well, there, there is, of course, uh, everything that happened in the 70s, and then you have certainly some exceptions um, and some precursors and so on. But the, to my personal uh, appreciation in 2006, there's a sort of a boom of, of uh, big star architects that um, uh, start being interested in the uh, in, in in the in the question. Uh, Mazdar City by Foster is one of them. Uh, quite impressive uh, project, a very highly uh, very high tech uh, with with like an electric autonomous car system and ventilation towers and so on and so on. Um, I, I mentioned this project because um, it, there is something e extremely fascinating about, about Mazdar. So the, the whole square city um, supposedly uh, uh, situated in, in, a, in a desert area um, at, the, at the border of Abu Dhabi is, is walled. Um, and the reason that it is walled is because they, there is an, an attempt to create a microclimate in this in this city. So the, the ventilation shafts uh, draw down uh, cooler air and 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 try to reduce the, the the heat in this in this place by by a few degrees. But coincidentally, the the um, Mazda, with its claim of being uh, a carbon neutral city. Uh, uh, this, this claim also goes exactly till the border of that, uh, of that wall. So everything that is uh, outside of the wall is not um, in the uh, sustainability claim of, of, uh, of, of Mazda. And I found this find quite a, a fascinating uh, situation where you have an architectural object that separates the sustainable from the unsustainable. So the airport is 
uh, outside of, uh, of the square, so it is not part of the claim. The cement factory is outside of the, of, of the square, so it's not part of the claim, and so on and so on. And then when we, when we look at Mazdar city as a, as a sort of a square city in the middle of the desert and we, we zoom out a bit, then we see, of course, that uh, it is not a city in the desert, but it's more like a, a sort of a suburban neighborhood of, of, of Abu Dhabi, which itself is, of course, part of, uh, of, of this, this oil economy. So we have to go to extreme, extreme um, uh, sort of uh, intellectual uh, lengths to try and consider this place a separate and sustainable from everything that uh, that, that that surrounds it. it it is quite literally the, the 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 plot of land that is accorded to the architect is the limit of the, of the responsibility and and i think it's um, it's quite extreme in Mazdar city, but it is, uh, it is something that we, we've seen uh, or we can see a lot uh, in, in, in architecture uh, up until to, today. 2008, the, there is a sort of a, a mainstream about what uh, being sustainable is. We go from a very abstract open idea to, to a number of, of sort of um, uh, very specific uh, uh, um, very specific measures and in terms of architecture uh, in, in uh, Northwest Europe, the most important thing is, of course, this, this question of insulation. Uh, no more single glass, double glass is, is, the, is, is at least the standard, but triple, quadruple, uh, that is the thing. So we're going for, to an architecture that is much more intensive in, uh, in, in material use. It's much more technological. And um, well, Rotor being interested in these, in these material cycles, we, we of course have a, a number of questions about uh, this. How am I doing in, in, in terms of uh, time? Okay. Um, 2008, we uh, set up a, a project together with, uh, with, with another organization to try and think about what um, a shop for secondhand building materials would look like in, uh, in the Brussels area. Uh, it would be a social economy project, uh, meaning that it, it, it would be a, a space where uh, people who have been unemployed for quite a long time would be uh, receiving uh, some, some work experience and so on. Um, of course, this, this never happened, but this is uh, something that has been quite instrumental in, uh, in, in, in other projects that follow. In 2010, we proposed a, a pavilion for the uh, Venice Biennale, the, uh, the, the, the Belgian pavilion, uh, which we dedicate to the question of where uh, in, in architecture. So how do materials react to the fact of uh, being, uh, being used? And so we inherit this uh, beautiful um, pavilion that was designed for exhibiting paintings. Um, and uh, we decide to exhibit in this space a number of materials that we extract from quite banal architecture uh, in and around Brussels. So what you see here is a, is a red carpet uh, with uh, traces of its use. So, Quite evidently, there must have been some object or table in the in the in the front of the of, of, of the image, so people walked around it to, towards the back. And so here you see the same uh, carpet exposed on the wall of, uh, of of that pavilion. And and you see that actually the carpet provides almost as a sort of a map, a plan uh, in in scale one to one of the of the room. Here you see that. Um, how people walk on a staircase is not a straight line it's a sort of a dancing uh, movement so this is uh, these are just the steps of uh, of a double pane uh, staircase and so we bring together in this space uh, a couple dozen of of, of of material samples accompanied with a, a, a little booklet uh, with theoretical uh, considerations so this, this project for us is the first that uh, reaches an international audience. And then from there on, we've been invited to do a number of, of uh, international exhibitions, um, notably a, a monography on, um, sorry, a monographic um, exhibition on the work of OMA at the Barbican in 2011, which for us is really uh, an important moment because um, it is a way of seeing how um, 
how codified the relationship between architecture and materials are. When a um, architect is drawing a, a, a sphere-shaped um, theater, um, he or she does not have a specific tube of steel in mind. The, the tube is going to be made to specification. So, so there's a number of, of, of um, intermediates that, that help architects deal with, with, with materials like samples, technical specifications, uh, and, and uh, uh, well, models, uh, BIM models or AutoCAD models or, or whatever. 2011, we win a tender for doing the first metabolic um, analysis of the waste streams uh, in building and demolition in the, in the Brussels region. And this is also quite an important uh, moment for us because it, it, uh, it establishes us as, uh, as, as experts on, uh, on, on this field. We uh, received the commission to, to make uh, uh, the first proper report of, of all of the data that is uh, that is available. And in parallel to that, we set up an, 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 a research process that is still ongoing, Opalis, which, which maps out um, uh, all of the traders and secondhand building materials uh, that we can uh, that we can find. So we 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 um, finally found a focus for our factory visits. We visit these companies, uh, which will sell secondhand cobblestone or structural steel or bricks, um, and these are companies that are specialized in sort of the. Uh, um, uh, the treatment of, of uh, secondhand materials so that they can again be used uh, uh, in, in, in quite a normal um, architectural process. Uh, 2012, I, just a brief, it's not a project by us, but it, it shows it quite elegantly the, the, the problem that we're facing at this point. This is a competition for um, a, a design center with an emphasis on, on reuse and recycling already in the brief. The architects propose uh, to use uh, reused steel cladding during the competition phase, but of course there is no market in Brussels for uh, sourcing um, or finding this, this reused steel cladding. And so the contractor in the end uh, is, is forced to execute this with new steel that uh, he cho the, the architects choose in a few different colors to remind the, the original plan of the, of the, of the idea. And this, this is really sort of the chicken or the egg question that, that has followed us ever since. Uh, what do you do first? Can architecture create the demand and then hope that the industry will, will, will follow? Or should the industry make a sort of a, 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 a risky bet, uh, start proposing materials in the hope that architects pick them up in their, in their projects? And so we, we came up with a sort of a secret plan, which we called Horizon 2030, which was a non-commissioned uh, pro project. But uh, our plan for the development of a salvage industry in, in Brussels over the period of uh, uh, roughly two, uh, two, two, two decades. And we uh, start um, in, in an unsolicited way, uh, sending out letters um, and, 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 and correcting language that we find problematic. For instance, uh, Flanders, the, the region just besides Brussels, is publishing a vision document in which it says that uh, there is absolutely no tradition in the use of secondhand building materials and so on. We send a registered uh, letter uh, showing some of our, uh, the pictures that we took uh, while visiting companies. And um, the result is that in this vision document by the Flemish region, all of a sudden the existing dealers are seen as a sort of key actors that are a step stone to further uh, diversify and develop uh, circular building strategies, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so, so we, we, we really do, um, we, we pay a lot of attention in, this, in these documents because we know that they are going to be instrumental in, uh, uh, in, 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 in building uh, this, uh, this industry. In parallel, in 2014, we start a spin-off, which is in the beginning just a project, uh, rotor deconstruction. Um, so rotor deconstruction goes into buildings that are slated for demolition and uh, sells off parts of those buildings before 
uh, we, we can. So we work with a sort of a catalog, the building becomes a shop. We document everything that is inside it. We, we make estimates of how much it would cost to, to salvage these materials and we deliver them directly to the, the client. And so this is the moment where we discover the, the, the economy. Um, the fact that you can demount something doesn't make it reusable. Um, it needs to have a, 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 a certain uh, market uh, value. You can not in a structural way uh, run a, a loss on, on such uh, operations. And so we need to find a, a business plan. 2014, the, our first really big project is the, the construction of uh, part of the interiors of General de Banque. Remember, uh, it's that building uh, full of wenge brass uh, and, and exquisite uh, granite floors. And so there is no way in terms of timing that we can uh, salvage these materials and sell them off. Uh, it's also quite evident that they are uh, extremely valuable. So um, we decide to um, um here, here you see the demounting of, uh, of of the decorative ceiling of the entrance hall and then we decided to 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 rent a storage space and uh, and 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 we start a new phase in our business in which we are uh, having an inventory and so on uh, asbestos is a huge problem uh, in in this in this context this is sort of the the the, the way we access the the, the building site and once we have this storage space, once it is known that we can handle projects at this scale, um, we, we do all kinds of uh, uh, big buildings. Uh, in some cases, like the socialist uh, headquarters, um, only the doorknobs, because we didn't have much time for, for, for anything else. Having uh, a lot of proposals at, at, at those times, we start thinking about how to market these materials, how to clean them. Uh, we develop packaging, distribution strategies. Uh, we, we set up a website. Um, our warehouse uh, becomes uh, much, much better. We open a shop uh, and so on. And so at this point, uh, there's really a, a division. Uh, um, Rotor DC uh, becomes a separate company. And uh, Rotor, as it existed previously, uh, remains uh, more or less functional. And so this is what we have today. Rotor as a nonprofit is focused on long-term thinking, strategic positioning. It's uh, funded mostly with grants and, and uh, consultancy fees. It's a very activistic uh, nonprofit. Rotor DC, on the other hand, is a company. It is a cooperative company, but it still needs to make its bottom line. It's a commercial player. It's opportunistic, uh, goes for quick wins, offers solutions, and uh, is limited by the market uh, conditions. 2014, we make a vademecum. Um, so this is a manual for for public administrations on how to properly uh, demolish or how to properly tender uh, big demolition uh, uh, projects. So we work on this for two years. We hire a lawyer inside our, of our office to, uh, to work with us on, 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 on this. And, uh, and this is a document that uh, uh, is, is still in use today by a lot of administrations and that we are very, very proud of. 2015, we give our input to the regional program of circular economy, um, which is a, 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 um, yeah, it's a, it's a hugely important uh, document, and it's it's quite amazing how uh, few architects are present in 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 these uh, policy documents, um, or how how well. It's amazing. The two things are amazing. It's amazing how easily it is to give input to these documents. And it's amazing that not more people uh, within architecture are doing it. And so from then on, we're running on this, uh, uh, well, in, in, we're running in, in, in two different uh, moduses. Um, the blue projects are the ones that we are running uh, through rotor deconstruction. So for instance, uh, uh, the demolition of the, the bottom end building in which we were involved, salvaging the, 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 the partition wall. Uh, the yellow projects are, still remain the project that we do uh, all together. The two companies combined, um, for instance, we establish a sort of a trade organization for all of the uh, uh, companies active in, in, in reuse. Um, we finally find um, back those uh, fantastic allochromatic uh, panels by, by Ralph Clermans, his uh, 
Sun actually contacts us and we are now in the process of, of finding new spaces uh, where to uh, uh, display them. Um, Rotor DC grows in 2019. We were 10, by now we are 15. Um, by the end of this uh, of, of this year, um, it, it becomes a real business. The design side of things also kicks off. So um, we're doing projects, for instance, with 51 and 4E, uh, which is a local office. Um, uh, it, we win a competition for the uh, of the Brussels region. Instead of building a building, we propose to move a, a building from. Uh, um, a space where it was blocking the extension of the airport to um, a neighborhood in, uh, in, in Brussels. Uh, we work on the uh, renovation of the Philips Tower. In this case, we are uh, supplying uh, the, uh, a floor that we salvaged in the, in the, in the General de Banque uh, building when we will be working from uh, the end of this year and onwards on the uh, as a consultant on the renovation of the Barragon building, which was, uh, for your reminder, one of the last ones that was realized in this uh, in this Manhattan plan. And so, uh, to 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 conclude, uh, more or less, I, I would like to finish with a, a quotation of Bruno Latour, which is a, a, who is a, a, an, who has been an influential writer uh, for our office, and he um, he says um, we have always actively sorted the uh, elements uh, inherited from different times, from previous times. We can still uh, do that sorting. It is the sorting that makes the time, and not the time that does the sorting. And um, and and this is a, an attitude that we uh, try to embrace in uh, in, in most of our uh, projects, um, meaning that in, instead of constantly trying to go back to this tabula rasa and starting over uh, from a sort of an, an ideological point of view, we try to see the qualities of what is already there and and inherit. Um, or accept this inheritance to the largest extent uh, as possible and then transform it in such a way that it allows uh, today humans uh, uh, to, uh, um, well, to live with them or to benefit uh, from, from, uh, from them. Oh, one last project because uh, we're very uh, proud of this. So the Opalis uh, project, uh, the mapping of, of the, the, the actors Active while well, the company is active in the in the salvage industry, we first started doing it the yellow ones in uh, in, in Belgium um, in in 2012, um, and uh, we have recently secured the European European funding to uh, include uh, the UK, France, part of the Netherlands, and so on into this into this map. So recently, our network of actors has dramatically. Uh, changed in, in in scale. We're now talking about uh, 500, 600 dealers in uh, in secondhand building materials with different specialities and uh, and so on. So the objective of that of that project is to increase by 50% the, the amount of reclaimed building materials that are circulated in uh, in, in northwestern Europe, um, and and uh, it, it, it we are well on track at uh, realizing that uh, that that objective. And in that point, we, we have a sort of a, a spin-off free uh, hobby project going on. Um, Opalis is a, is a project that uh, in, interests or seems to interest a, a lot of people around the globe. So, so uh, we're trying to, um, uh, to extend this, this, uh, this project also to other territories. For instance, uh, some student work in, in Brazil started mapping the, uh, the salvage industry there. You will have noticed that Australia is a completely blank space on our map for now. So, uh, so perhaps there's uh, people that are interested uh, in, 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 uh, in, in helping us pushing this, uh, this project forward. So on that note, um, I would like to end maybe with uh, uh, just a few pictures of, of, of projects that have been realized with our materials, because this is really the, the nice thing. We are no longer 
dependent on our own architecture practice to build things in a certain way. We are providing means of construction to other offices on a daily basis, dozens of, of transactions per, per day. And so our materials end up in, in, uh, in, in numerous projects uh, around the city. And uh, it's very fun to go out and, and, and see some lights or marble slabs or, or, or whatever uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this new context. So realizing that I will probably have passed very well my uh, allocated time, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it at that. Super. Thank you very much, Martin. That was uh, wonderful, uh, really inspiring uh, presentation. And, uh, and I particularly like the, uh, the uh, leaving on the note of the expansion of this program um, and seeing the examples of where it's being used. Um, so I'd like to um, uh, spend a little bit of time having a, a conversation with you both. So if I could just um, start, if I could just start, um, uh, Martin, uh, I actually got a question that probably applies to both of you. But since uh, we just uh, left for Martin, I'd, I'd kind of put it to you first. Um, the work is very much um, rooted in a specific urban and cultural context, um, not least because from where it comes from, Belgium, um, uh, in that country, you know, in past generations, there's a history of using good materials. Um, uh, the the use of stone and hardwoods and tiles, materials that, in, in a sense, are worth actually um, uh, uh, getting back into use again. Um, and um, in some cases, when we look around the world, um, there's a question on how adaptable uh, this work might be to other countries. And so probably uh, you, you partly answered it by just showing that map of other countries. But I, I suppose there is a question around, um, are there countries that have tremendous potential to adapt and this, uh, deconstruct and reuse building materials and other countries where there is very little potential? And what are the factors that control, I guess, this scalability and this, this idea about where it can expand in other parts of the world? Okay, so so yes, it's a it's a very big question, of course, but uh, let, let me give you a few examples. Like, well, of course, a major factor is uh, the access to to new materials. Uh, if you're in a in a space where it's easier to truck in concrete pavers than to pick them up from the from 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 the streets. Um, then, uh, then, then that's what's going to happen. Um, a second factor is, of course, the the labor cost. Um, I, I didn't mention it in my in, in my lecture, but we have this informal uh, um, so, sort of benchmark, uh, which is like if you hire a skilled worker to pick up concrete pavers for one day, and you see how much pavers he ha he, he can uh, palletize, and then uh, you see what that skilled worker has costed you for 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 the one day as compared to the, uh, the to the cost of the paper it's a sort of an, an an index and in belgium it's totally impossible it's much much more expensive to hire somebody to just pick up i mean these are pavers that are positioned without mortar without uh, any form of of of, of binder just Picking up the paver costs more uh, than buying a new one by a factor of two, maybe even two and two and a half. This is a, a totally different situation, for instance, in Bulgaria or, or Romania, which is just a, a thousand or two thousand kilometers away from from here. I can imagine that uh, it, there's many contexts in in which this this is a different a different given. Uh, and then there's a, a third factor, um, which is um, the, the one that, that architects and, and, and engineers uh, obsess about, of course, mostly is the, the impact of the building, uh, the, the building technology. Um, we, we found, um, for instance, that in the, in the US, uh, there is a very active salvage industry for uh, timber. And it is mostly because, uh, well, so many houses are timber framed. There's such a big uh, aftermarket for the for the materials. So much of that wood is is very high quality, um, and there is a, a very interesting tax. Uh, well, 
is from a fiscal point of view is quite interesting to set up a nonprofit that salvages wood for 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 various reasons but so in in the in the united states you have a sort of a perfect storm for timber framing whereas in brussels is something we've been trying to set up uh for uh for for years and we cannot find sufficient sources of of uh, of wood and we cannot uh make it work economically uh denailing the the the, the wood so it, it, it's a very, very, it's very difficult to make to make generalizations. Like we, we will in Europe ship in, literally ship in barn wood from the, the from the US uh, in in huge quantities to to have that sort of uh, unique Starbucks uh, uh, look. Um, whereas we are exporting 1930 styles to, uh, uh, to to Russia to have that Belgian bar uh, uh, feeling. So every Every region sort of has his his perfect storm of conditions that makes certain things possible or or, or, or not. Yeah. And maybe one last thing is also that what I've been talking about during the the, the whole of my uh, presentation is actually the formal uh, reuse industry. Besides that, of course, you have a, a, a huge part of the, the the reuse economy, which is an informal one, which is, uh, for instance. Uh, Romanian, Bulgarian, Polish workers on building sites uh, shipping home electrical components uh, from these demolitions, uh, or, or using them uh, uh, in, in, in well in, in an informal uh, in an informal way, well informal to me in any case, and so we we haven't uh, we haven't investigated or we haven't worked on that at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's that's very interesting. Um, I, I guess um, the the with all of those different factors you've raised, I guess there's kind of there's one sort of um, slightly binary kind of consideration in, in all this is is that on the one hand you have a potential market that um, that, that that creates demand um, and can and you can see how that demand can grow um, somewhat organically and and what have you over time. And on the other hand, you have potentially um, uh, regulation. So you basically have either bottom up or top down kind of scenario uh, or a carrot or a stick kind of scenario. Um, so not noting, uh, noting what you said about all the different factors and all the different ways that can influence us in, the, in that context of um, uh, regulation versus market or top down or bottom up, which of those two factors do you think will most strongly drive the kind of increase scalability of what you're doing. It's, you're absolutely right to point out that there is a, a role, uh, an important role to play for uh, for policy. Um, and, and this policy can be uh, in the form of, 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 of legislation, uh, but it can also be uh, in the form of procurement policies of big companies or um, like for instance, when we are working on the uh, um, the, the 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 refurbishment of um, the Philips Tower, so that's like a forty thousand square meter tower uh, that sets has set an ambition uh, to spend about a few percent. I don't know exactly a few percent of the uh, of their budget on on salvage material. Well, that like doubles or triples the market for secondhand components in uh, in, in 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 Brussels. Like it. It, it means that this instantly creates a few jobs. Instantly, there's a number of companies who are like, "Wait a second, we, we there's a demand now," and so and so that's 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 one part of it. From a public policy point of, of view, I guess the, the the most important thing is 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 to get rid of um, bar barriers, um, like for instance. Um, boardwalk stones, like the, the stones that you use at the edge of the boardwalk to separate the street from the boardwalk. The, the uh, Belgium has a lot of uh, natural stone quarries and the quarries have lobbied in the 60s to establish the rule that all the stones, uh, all the boardwalk stones in a given street need to be of the same length. We don't care how long they are, but they need to be the same length to give a sort of a visual rhythm to the. Now, I do not know about any architect who is concerned with the sort of the rhythm of the uh, stones that line the, the, the boardwalk. So this is clearly a sort of a very efficient uh, sabotaging of the stone quarry companies 
um, that is still playing us uh, uh, well complicated complications like 50, 60 years after it, it has been written. Now it's a good thing because it means if if we make if we do lobbying efforts today, these will work for 50, 60 years as well. But but we need to at one point, you know, it it, it takes a lot for an administration that has been prescribing same length boardwalk stones for decades. All of a sudden, if you ask them why, they don't know why, but changing that rule implies a risk. Like it, 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 yes. it you don't know, maybe there's some kind of machine they use or you, you don't know what it's going to imply. So, so just yeah, yeah. changing that is like a six months research pro process to, to do it. And that's the stuff we need to do. Like we need to go through all, all of those stupid rules and, and, and kind of establish what is valid in, in all of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, I guess there's a, there's a kind of a segue, um, uh, Anupama, with uh, with the work you've shown, um, and and I guess it kind of has to do with the um, the legacy traditions and the legacy technologies that um, that have existed in a place. And and I'm interested in in, in essentially your your kind of move from India to Berlin. Um, the work you've shown um, demonstrates an amazing potential for adapting building processes um, and, and and thinking of new ways of of making things. And and this is probably not surprising in an Indian context where there's an immense history of of uh, fine, high quality making and manual hand making um, uh, materials and objects. Um, and so this makes a lot of sense. Um, Germany um, obviously has a markedly different historic tradition um, reflected in it being the home of the Bauhaus, which famously brought together handmade traditions uh, into making within the new industrial age. Um, and that obviously has had a huge legacy on Germany, on Europe, and on the world. <clears throat> um, so in that, in that context, has it been a challenge for you to, or let me say, how do you kind of understand that adapting of your way of experimenting from one context where it makes complete sense to another context where it's rather more complicated. Might the principles that uh, that you've shared with us today, uh, emerging from your experiences initially in India, be adapted to that famous industrial context of, of Germany? Um, so, uh, Andrew, I love this question. Uh, what I would like to say is that actually I really do not see myself so different as others. I think that's what I really want to bring up here seriously, that we are seeing the world too polarized unnecessarily because within each country, there is everything. When I, when I came and lived in Brisbane or whether I lived in Spain, I saw equally the making culture. When I see what Martin spoke today about collecting, he got the idea to collect those, even if it did not look like the obvious thing to do in today's Belgian context of what it costs, I, I just would like to uh, explain also my work, having grown up in Bombay in the context, I showed you those kind of images. So even though my work looks like it belongs more in India, it was, it's not the common thing that fits there, you know? Yeah. But, okay. uh, and, and the fact that I'm drawing from the making culture that was there in India, I also see it as a universal thing because as I was saying, we are homo sapiens. We are not, we are more common than different. It's just that the cultural context, the climatic context and all those differences that you mentioned are also prevalent inside India in very little kilometers away. And when I work in Berlin, when I came here after the reunification, I noticed that there are always there are parallel um, initiatives that where people do things and there are things that the architect gives them through the developer. This is just a way of looking, you know, it's not actually there. People make uh, just because a factory bread exists, they don't stop baking cakes at home. They don't stop knitting sweaters for their grandchildren while they, when they watch TV and it doesn't cost per hour so much because somebody hand knitted it. Yeah. Just like massage exists, everything exists on a home level, on a community level. You know, so I would like to actually question this. I think this is more a question of really, uh, you know, like that book, Thinking Slow and Fast. It's about just thinking and seeing what you see. And sometimes we come from a professional gaze where you don't recognize materials around you. Mm -hmm. So I would like to also continue the previous discussion where you spoke about the economy and how does it 
work. See, mm-hmm. if if there is an economy where to throw away those stones in Belgium or in Australia, wherever, if the throwing away culture is only because it is cheaper, the question is, where are the unaccounted costs? It cannot be cheaper. It is not cheaper. If the true cost is billed to those people, the human time cannot be that much more costly. It's because I noticed, for example, in, in India, we grow Alfonso mangoes or cashew nut, which we no longer can afford to eat because it gets exported. And when I buy them in Berlin, it's so cheap. Or if, you know, some sushi and all that compared to the original country, this is just the modern economic, our gaze at economy, which is wrong. And that is creating, it's making large supply chains deliver less quality and leaving huge garbage piles and all kinds of things. And when we look at the whole, we will realize that again, whether you're industrialized or not is not the point. Mm -hmm. Those are just the habits. My question is to look at our habits and to not assume the first impression of a place, but take a little time, deconstruct Mm -hmm. what we thought, and Mm -hmm. then you see, can you do it? So even here, I, I, I have noticed Again, I'm not trying to apply the same experience that I have produced. Uh, Each project for me was like entering a new zone. But when I um, uh, did the research continued in Australia or in Spain or now in Berlin or in the US, the strategies are quite the same. The outcome is different. The strategy, when I say it's the same, is like looking what is around you. Often you think there's nothing around you. When I went to India, South India, there was nothing around me. So if I look around in Germany, my first impression is there are these industry catalogs and there's nothing around me. But my second look shows me not only a whole lot of things, humans have created architecture with whatever was around them. There is something around us. There Mm -hmm. is material on the earth. It could be stone, earth, Even the manufactured material is around you, actually. It's just being transformed, again, by humans, just -hmm. putting in some energy and you get something. Everything can be figured out. Mm -hmm. So I look at the material, but I look at what what do we like to produce that serves us? Because what we make is going to make us. And we, when you think of it that way, you want to be a bit careful what you're making. You know, that's what I'm saying. If, if, if you, yeah, I, I, I'd like to second uh, a lot of the things you, you've said, Anupam, um, in, in the sense that um, it's, it's like, um, I, 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 it's a quote by someone, I don't know who, who, who said it exactly, but there is this, this quote saying like, it's, it's easier to uh, imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Yeah. Um, and and I, I, I think it's something that we are confronted with. Uh, against all the time where um, there is a confusion about this idea of economy uh, being some sort of natural law. Actually, the economy is a hugely codified, constructed uh, set of things. Like if it's, 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 a, it's a result of a number of specifications of the number of, of policies. If the demolition cost, uh, uh, like, as a society in, 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 in Brussels, we are collectively subsidizing demolition because we allow them access to roads. We, we do not uh, take into account the, the, the noise production, the businesses that, go, uh, that, that, that have to close uh, when a big building like that goes down and so on and so on. So if, if we should just stop subsidizing these demolition practices, um, all of a sudden, like, I'm, I'm not asking for money for the good practices. I'm, I'm saying, like, if we would just charge uh, what it costs to do a demolition at that, at, at that scale, it's, 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 it would be unbelievable. I, I wouldn't have to do anything else than, 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 uh, than, than that. And so, but that said, it, it doesn't mean that, like, that still doesn't answer the question about how you can change this, uh, this economic system. Like how, as architects, as designers, as human beings, how can we interfere uh, with, with, with these this, this, this systems? Because 
we see what well, we see in our work that that sometimes we are making progresses on minor things and 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 uh, and on the other hand like uh, when the economy slows down all of a sudden there's like a relief package of billions and billions of euros that does the exact opposite of what we're, we're, we're wanting to do so it's i would it's, like sorry no go ahead so i would like to just continue what you said and suggest uh, also a real solution which i do see as practical Uh, you know, look, I would like to give two examples. One is when I lived with the solar powered in my house, everything for the whole time I lived in the hut and in that other house, it was all decentralized uh, power supply from my own solar panels. Now, what happens is the mainstream, you talked about subsidizing. This is very important for collective life. The 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 normal grid power is not cheaper it is only the end user is paying a less part and the government is subsidizing the entire thing when i buy my solar panel they are not giving me the proportionate subsidy today because i'm a i'm a minority i'm, I'm tra- setting another trend so i'm going to have to bear all that brunt because of my idealism that thing but when i show this lifestyle over many years and more and more people do it then it is being considered and the subsidies are not enough the other people are not being made to pay their p- price for creating the polluting way of life and we are paying that so is that why we should stop doing it mm-hmm. of course it's not fair and things but if you go into that negative feeling uh life will pass us by if we wait for them to change i just feel you have to do what you believe in and and you save elsewhere and it's not fair and everything but the only way to change is whoever believes should do it look we couldn't in berlin afford organic food but a lot of people did it and today the price difference is so little in other parts of the world it's there's a big difference uh-huh. but in germany now not it's very very doable to to eat a little bit less and then uh-huh. eat healthy and then that's what is becoming the mainstream so it's just a question of looking at it that way all the norms like you said all the economy is man made construct so are all the norms how did we manage to stop smoking overnight in public spaces somebody made a rule today there's a covid rule and all of us are ready to go zoom there are the older generation and all the zoom was available we were using it for long in our practice to communicate it's the adaptability i spoke about we are adaptable we have to know what are the natural laws and here's a world we've created where people are ready to go against gravity when they design some architecture you see in the renderings gravity is not seeming like a real law the finiteness of the natural materials on the planet doesn't seem our body is not being taken as a limit but man made constructs are being taken as a given mm-hmm. so it's about mm-hmm. just a little bit of being open minded courageous and integrity you know to just live and create what we believe in because if we decide that the the throwing away is not an option then we will everything will realign so long as we allow we know what is wrong and we still do it that is a big problem and i really would ask architects at least to not do it because we know it would feel so bad you know it feels really shit at the end of the day that you contributed to a thing knowing that it was not good for you or anyone else and we still do it i was i was going to ask you uh, both really um about uh, in a sense the the agency of the profession to um to uh, to make the changes that we're all talking about um and maybe to ask both of you um what are the factors that maybe are slowing or not really enabling the profession to move fast enough and what might we might what we might do to uh, to encourage uh, a greater change and sooner so within you, you, within architects yeah. well that's more or less what i what i was <laughs> what i was yeah i it, it's what i was going to uh, to answer to uh, uh, anupama's um, uh, previous remark is that you know when we when we started rotor deconstruction like so as i said we did in 2008 we did this first studies and then in 2011 a, a metabolic uh, study and so we knew um what kind of materials what kind of quantities we we, we would be dealing with and so on we, we had a very good knowledge of that uh, of of that situation 
but then it took till 2014 to, to actually start rotor deconstruction. And in, in that period, it's not that we were not doing anything. It's we were trying to, con to, to convince others to, to do it, telling them like, here's the data. Look, you can make it work economically. You just need to get some starting capital and so on. And, and nobody was sort of following us. And then when we started rotor de deconstruction in the beginning, selling materials directly from the building site, I, I remember that we had, this, we had this joke in the office saying like, you know what, this is a theater play. We're going to buy Teslas or rent Teslas and drive around in them. And we're going to appear like successful businessmen. And, uh, and this is going to be our business plan. And everybody's going to want to do it just because somebody is making money out of it. And, and this, this idea of, of fiction, uh, like sometimes, I mean, I mean when, when I talk about uh, our practice, I make it sound easier because, because there's no point in discouraging people uh, 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 not, to, not, not to try it. Like there's, there's conversations to be had, of course, and there's no ones to be, to, to, to be, to be brought. But, but this idea of fiction is, is quite important because what I what I have felt when uh, when 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 I'm um, talking with like project managers in, in real estate companies or even policy makers and so on, is that there's so much self-enforced limits. Um, like if you're a project manager and um, you're in charge of let's say designing a, a, the lobby of a new uh, 100 million euro building. And you want to spend, let's say, 500,000 euros on the, the cladding uh, in marble of that building rather than aluminium. That's okay, you know, that's not a problem because they get marble for that 500,000 euros. You want to spend, let's say, 50,000 euros uh, for properly disposing of your, of, of, of your garbage, then it's like, yes, but, you know, we are on a tight budget, we need to make everything count and, and so on. So th there's this fiction in the head of, of project managers that money can be spent for certain things. Like it's almost like a, a sort of a corporate cultus on what money can, 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 can be spent. And then ridiculous small amounts of money that would change everything, like a few, a few 10,000 euros that cannot be done because, you know, it's not been done before and everybody's sort of like, oh, no, can, can we do it? And, and it's peanuts for these, these companies. Like the, the, the difference in price, uh, like if you have, let's say 40,000 euros, uh, sorry, sorry 40,000 square meters of office space, the, the difference in price between deconstruction, so properly disassembling things uh, and, and demolishing it will be maybe 10, 15 euros a square meter in price difference. So, you know. What, what is that on a, in, in a market that can go from, from three to 4,000 euros in, in, in price fluctuation uh, in, in just a couple of months? You know, it's, it's nothing. You can, you can do it. But, so so, so we um, need to sort of make it seem absolutely normal. It needs to seem banal to do it in a, in, in a way. I agree. I think also the same thing is about uh, the same is about the, you know, the tendency to prefer spending on machines than the humans, uh, because even if it's a very minimal amount to give a little care to a thing, because if that care is given, it will last forever. But uh, there is a tendency that if a, ma a machine has to be bought or something or to throw away and buy a new printer that is taken as serious and anything else is uh, is redundant. I would say there is a it is really, you asked, what could we do to be more um, empowered, I think, and to not be impotent. Uh, let me put it that way. Mm. I think we have to really deconstruct some limiting beliefs, which we keep reinforcing by repeating in the incestuous circles. The people out there are much more open than even the architects because they got so used to perhaps justifying the things you you surrendered and then you the tendencies to justify why you did it rather than uh, speak optimistically about what you could do and i think so the simple thing is even in schools etc there, there it's very important to give the good news and however small how many ever people are doing it like i feel so good st talking here with martin and see what he's managed you know and these are the type of things we need to spread because uh, if it took us that much effort, it will take the, the others less effort if we, we, we can share. And that's why I'm saying we need to go towards collaboration rather than competition. 
because in the competitive world people are holding back and not sharing what they discovered and they are just justifying the wrong practice by repeating and repeating and making it the norm which is is a human construct so it's just about undoing and and it seems to me undoing and and connecting that connecting the yes. dots between things um right. because i think that's one of the things that joins uh, this afternoon's session with this morning session was understanding how um in a way one little node by itself yes we need leadership and yes we need change but it needs to bring lots of other nodes along in the process which is why presumably martin why you um have this map of all the places that you can get recycled material from because then all of a sudden a, a an ecology is visible for people and it becomes it becomes real um uh, but it is interesting to see that that um, uh, those I, that idea of um, something is affordable or not affordable, something that will last and is is worth is worth the money depending on what time frame you put on it and how much of those horizons are entirely arbitrary, or at least if not arbitrary, they are invented in a past generation and are just still with us as a legacy that we're trying to work through. Um, it's it's uh, it's a it's a challenge, challenging work, but I think you're you're both um, in different ways um, uh, uh, trying to break through into a new way of of building and constructing. I, I mean, I, I think one of the interesting questions, just pulling it back to the this question of time and scale and, and, and what have you, is is um, whether we think um, what we can do to realign people's understanding of how long a building should last because we know that there are buildings that will last a thousand years or 10 years. Um, and we know that in some cases, a bit of permanence might be not, might be not a problem. And uh, a, a bit of sorry, temporariness might be not be a problem. And so we have this whole question around how we understand the life cycle and the life of a building. Um, do you have a view as to how we can, um, uh, we can change attitudes so that where it's important things will last a long time. And where it's not, things can be disassembled. Uh, is there a way we can we can bring the general public along on that conversation? I think one of the things to talk about, um, because, uh, because people are very insecure when they invest money and they think it's temporary. But if one talks about it from a wider framework of maintenance, you know, when I lived in the little hut I showed you, I, d I realized that in, in traditional architecture or ancient architecture, there were some elements that you had to replace, like the thatch roof, you had to replace it every three years. The, there are the beams that you, or the rope, you have to replace every 12 years. And maybe there are a couple of uh, slats on the flooring you replace every 20 years and so on. It's like the body, the dead cells are constantly being shed but the, the, my body remains the same, right? New cells are being created every minute. Mm -hmm. So architecture doesn't have to be, in fact, the so-called permanent architecture or these concrete buildings, they look fully settled, but after a certain number of years, they will degrade and you cannot have this renewing aspect inbuilt. Temporary doesn't mean that uh, because of the new perspective of looking at it through the artificial material lens, we think that those natural materials degrade. But to put, to renew up mud plaster or something, it's like I can have a bath or I put a new nail polish when the old one is off. It mm -hmm. doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. a, including the maintenance yeah. in the thing. It's not threatening. Yeah. I, 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 I'd like to respond to that. It's, it's, it's quite amazing how, how much I agree with most of what you're, of, of what you're saying. So, so um, no, I, I just want to give some color to the, to, to the conversation by, by, by saying that a lot of the architecture that we experience as being permanent is actually, um, is almost like a set design displaying permanentness. Like for instance, when we were working on the work of, uh, of, of OMA, uh, we visited Kunsthal, uh, the famous uh, art space uh, in Rotterdam designed by, by Kolhas um, at the beginning of his, his career. And uh, we, not, we went there on a Monday because it's the only day we, could, uh, we, we had left. And, and, and so they opened the space especially for us. And we were uh, received by the uh, maintenance workers and they told us they were painting the walls, well, repatching the walls white every Monday. 
every Monday the institution is closed and the walls are white because somebody is painting them every week, you know? And, and so it's not that the walls in the museum are white and the ones in your house have stains, it's that one is, is almost like a war to, to keep them white. The, 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 the display of, of, of means on these walls are, are, so, are, are so immense. And, and I, this was shortly after we did uh, the, the, our, our pavilion in, 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 uh, in, in, in Venice. I think there is also a question about how we, how we represent and how we talk about uh, architecture. If you open up um, most architecture magazines, they will show you brand new buildings, you know, it renders or, 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 or images of things where even the power plugs have been photoshopped out uh, completely. Uh, like the, the photographer can only go in before the users take over the, the, the space. There's very few exceptions of buildings that are being portrayed with, with actual human beings uh, uh, living in or having lived in that. And, and this is a bit strange because for me, buildings, they become more interesting 15, 20 years down the road. Then it's when you really start seeing what the genius of the design was, whether it worked or not, whether it was resistant to change, whether it was accommodating or, 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 or failing. And, 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 uh, and, and so I, I think the, the, the dictatorship of the, the, the render or the, the visual culture in, in, in architecture is, is, is one of the things we need, to, we need to challenge. We need to really think about how we, like even in design, you know, the, the, the drama of having uh, the first scratch on your IKEA table is such a, <laughs> an unnecessary event, you know, it's, it was bound to happen. It, it was, it, it is part of the design. It, it's part of what you accept when you buy this table. So, so it's useless fighting yes. this. I think it's very interesting because the, the, the narrative that we create by only creating in our head and then see the world through the narrative we created in the incestuous architectural circles, it is actually not in the minds of the people. They also don't understand those renderings and the, what our jargon and what terms we've come up with. But we've created that world, which is a very in, inside uh, scene. And then because of that, we are seeing the world that way, because we are alienated from the real thing. So I think I find this part of the thing a bit dangerous and it is some kind of major undoing to be done in the architectural community, in our academia, how we are, you know, how we are using academia to cut our students from the ground realities rather than immersing more in it mm -hmm. to come up with real problem uh, solutions. So, yeah. Well, I think there's a, there's a lot that we need to uh, we need to do both uh, within the profession and certainly um, outside it in the wide network of things that um, we rely on to build our buildings and our cities. Um, and so unfortunately, we've we've kind of run out of time. I feel like we could have carried on talking for another half an hour uh, right now, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, the uh, how, what can I say? The clock is against us, and so time. <laughs> needs to be called now. Before I I, uh, I thank you both, uh, I'd like I'd like to just um, do two things. Round up a bit on on the day on on what we've heard um, for those um, listening, and also to thank a few people and to talk about uh, what's happening next. So um, I, I will I, actually maybe maybe now is a good time to thank you both for your for your wonderful presentation and your and your conversation today. Uh, we look forward to some point in the future, maybe seeing you in Australia uh, for real, uh, in, 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 in real life, you might say. Um, but it's been wonderful to have you here uh, today. So thank you um, and, uh, and, and look forward to speaking to you again soon. At the beginning of today, Norwid Carl Ambriggs noted something about an indigenous approach to the world that rather struck me. She said, when we talk about country, we talk about it as if we're talking about ourselves, one and the same thing. This point was reinforced by Sel and Rees. Imagine that for a moment. We have a shared responsibility to look after the land so that it can look after us. Another form of the same reciprocity was evoked by Bruce Pascoe when he pointedly asked, what does it say about a person that they don't care about the future and actively frustrate those who do? Does that person not care about their own children and their grandchildren? This idea of acting today like it matters tomorrow 
is the cornerstone of what all our speakers have been talking about today. Many of us are not there yet. We're still denying that our actions, born of old historic habits, have consequences in the future, both near and far. Yes, we are slowly, reluctantly, begrudgingly lumbering into some kind of haphazard action. But it's becoming clear to many of us that we need much more. Nothing short of a fundamental shift is needed in how we understand our agency on this planet as not separate, not individual and distinct from other agencies, but connected to everything else. Bruce reminds us of this habit of having agency for millennia in Australia. The land grab two centuries ago was born of the lie that the people living here had no agency on the land. They didn't do anything on it. So with that, why not just take it from them? Martin and Anna Palmer talked about agency too, but through a different lens. As architects trying to innovate and explore new ways to build and construct, what is made very clear is that this can only happen if there are others brought along on the journey. We have, over the years, decades, centuries even, built an entire infrastructure of how we build. Supply chains, manufacturing infrastructure, commercial landing and buying regimes, planning controls, not to mention professional codes of practice and disciplinary areas of specialization, if not isolation. It's all very well to come with a good idea that you can sharpen and polish and perfect. But if you don't bring the wider ecology of actors into the frame, nothing can be done at scale. We are stuck in a cycle of bit by bit change as opposed to the systemic change that's needed. The leg bones connected to the planning code bone, the planning codes connected to the construction code bone and so on, it's all connected. This is somewhat what Br Tiga Brain is also trying to do to show us how things are connected. As an environmental engineer and artist, Tiga is interested in provocatively exposing what we normally think of as the hidden infrastructure of how we live, such as plumbing and wastewater, and bringing it into sight, exposed so that it's no longer infrastructure under and below reality, but it's rather infrastructure, the stuff that holds us all together. Projects like solar protocol and coin-operated wetland beautifully reflect this attitude. Technology fatigue is not the problem, or not necessarily the problem, but can help us do things differently, if in the right hands. It can help build connections. Timothy talks about connections too, about what they call the symbiotic real, as opposed to the word nature. They resist how we use the word nature as out there, separate from us, because it disconnects us from it. And that disconnection is what allows us to blithely to carry on living relatively unchanged while disaster happens around us. Disconnection is the key. And the consequence, as Timothy reminds us, is bound in those two frightening words, mass extinction. More than frightening. Thinking about the next hundred years is terrifying, they say. The next thousand years is horrifying. The next 10,000 years, petrifying, literally turned to stone. What he was doing just then was to look at timescales We've been busy with time scales too over the last few years, thinking about future frames for how things will change. By 2030 this, by 2050 that, 10, 20, 30 years, this is only a little terrifying. But some of us have children that may well live um, another 60, 70 years. And what of their children, our grandkids? We need a new time frame. What if the first question we asked of every decision we were making was how will this impact what is around me in the next hundred years, in the next thousand years? Perhaps then we might be heading in a better direction. The question is not bizarre. It was a lived reality only a hundred, a couple of hundred years ago in Australia, and it remains a lived reality for some Australians, as we were reminded this morning. How is that slide from Sarah visualizing 60,000 years of living on the land versus the last few years of colonial settlement? We need to be reminded visually, palpably, physically about those time frames more often, maybe every day. The long frame was then and is now a reality for traditional owners and First Nations people across the planet. It is a reality that is easily accessible to us all as we drive past an escarpment in the road and it reveals a stratified line of rocks. Those stratified lines, and all they're all bendy and they trace pressures of tectonic plates that have compressed the land for billions of years. You can pull over, pick at the clay and pull away a small rock, which you're probably holding is something that was once at the bottom of the sea 10 to 20 billion years ago. You're probably holding something that no one has ever seen before. That lock 
that rock last saw air possibly 20, 30 billion years ago. This is geological time and it's the kind of moment that allows us to glimpse the different scales of time that many of our speakers have referred to today. We need to glimpse those different time frames. We need to bring that time frame to the decisions we make today. Are we there yet? No. Are we getting there? Maybe. But in a final act of temporal dissonance for today, perhaps we need to slow down faster. Perhaps we need to take the long view in the next five minutes or even right now. But right now, I have a few reminders for everyone. First of all, the M Pavilion design reveal is coming and the expressions of interest uh, is opening on the 22nd, 7th of July for the 2021 program. I would like to thank the team who have worked tirelessly for many months to develop the program, let alone the last minute sprint to move online. Sam Redston, David Newstein, Jen Zalenka, Zalinska, Molly Braden, Gabriella Holland and Claire Kernow, and the production team at Unknown Visions and Light Years. Our colleagues at each of our partner institutions should also be thanked Melbourne University, RMIT University, Monash University, Swinburne University and in Sydney UTS. Thanks once again to our sponsors, the Victorian Government through Creative Victoria and Development Victoria, RACV, and of course, the Naomi Milgram Foundation. Now stay tuned for a very special announcement, the M Pavilion 2021 design announcement. MAP Studios from Venice shall be joining Amy Muir to reveal the much anticipated design of the M Pavilion 21, 2021, opening the 11th of November in the Queen Victoria Gardens. But of course, you might be joining us from 2050, and if you are, I hope you're well.